All right, we've talked so much about data today and uh, we needed a proper session on how to actually deal with the data flow in the fashion industry. So I would like to invite up on stage now David Thunmarker, Senior Advisor for Impulso and Daniel Di Benedetto, Regional Director, EuroNorth for Centric Software. Round of applause. <laughs> and as you can see, we all read the same memo of the Yeah, even the same code. Uh, beard, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Impressive. Uh, we need to mix it up, maybe. Um, <laughs> There you go. Um, I'm so excited about this session because we're going to deep dive into the whole issue of data. We've touched on data, we've talked about data, the need for data, there is data, what are we doing with the data? Let's try to find a way to define this for the fashion brands and try to see how we can uh, uh, move forward a little bit. Uh, David, I, I think I should start with you because you are now working together with the Impulso, which uh, this this uh, data upstart. But you have an experience working with fashion brands um, as the CEO of Tiger of Sweden for many years, and then Oscar Jacobson. So I thought maybe you can, from from that perspective, not the data side first, but we've talked about defining the problem. Could you define the problem from your horizon? Wha what is the kind of structure of the industry that we need to kind of tackle, do you think? Uh, but it's like, you know, I'm I shouldn't repeat myself uh, too much. I think it's been stated uh, for every single person who's been up there. Uh, and that's, uh, and for me, it's also to see the whole importance of this ecosystem. Because the value chain that everyone is talking about, it's starting with the customer demand and then be able to have real-time sales that you foster then in the production and so forth. So this will be a transformation and not uh, one single solution. Mm. Let's be a little bit more detailed. Uh, in this kind of uh, uh, um, value chain, what are some of the things we're doing wrong, you think? We are, to we are very guest-based. and. Uh, one part is the whole value chain, you know, you go meeting with the designers and then you will know that you will have the products on the shelf 12 to 18 months uh, ahead. And then if you then should look at sell-through numbers, then you need to wait another six to eight months. And then you have the truth. Mm. But then you have already designed a few collections in between. And that's why we are screaming for higher margins continue being efficient, doing the same thing, and say, let's keep and have a higher drop height instead of directing the root cause. And we are flooding the world with overproduction. Uh, the brands, and uh, I have also been responsible a lot, we, we know that 30% is uh, overproduction. So it's killing profitability and it's uh, killing environment. So lead times in data, meaning insights about how products are performing and so forth, that's a big Big issue. Uh, it's a very uh, dear uh, subject for me, and of, of course. course there I'm a little bit one-eyed. We'll get back to that, uh, Daniel. From from your perspective, how do you, how do you define the problem? What what problem are you attacking with with centric software? I think it's uh, it's about it, it is what you say. In a way, um, there, I there is a lot of data. It's it's a huge amount of data out there, but uh, we are two guess oriented and I think I guess I believe that that is because we are also in an industry where passion leads mm. so you you believe in your this style and this is the thing that will make it and so forth but you don't really consider the facts behind what is selling on the market and how can you then start to create a collection that will meet the new type of demand how can you build up that and since you're so your people in this industry are, in a way, very afraid of using data. It, almost like digitizing information into a system, it's like, should be forbidden. We are here to make art. We are here to make something. That, but art is probably only 10, 12, 15% of the buying decision of a client. Mm. The rest is data. The rest is information. 
and the more informed you are yourself, of course, the better decisions you, you can make. And I think that's, that's a bit the glitch and people need to start to use the, the platforms, the tools, the processes that involves adding data. And then we have the little topic that we have touched a couple of times today, sustainability. That is all about data. No data, no reports and you're screwed. You can't even sell the product, even if it's the best style, you know. Mm -hmm. That, I think people are too afraid of really, you know, starting to work with the data. It's almost about, it's almost like a, s a soccer player would be afraid of training. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you I win a game if you don't train? You know, how do you think? I think that's a bit... Um, well, I think but what, what both of you are talking about, and, and, and you're saying it in, in a couple of different ways, is that there's almost like an identity crisis in the fashion system. Because we have fashion brands that pride themselves on great design, coolness, trendness, and, and so forth. That's the kind of je ne sais quoi, the, the kind of... Magic. The, the magic of, of fashion, so to speak. Uh, and what's happening on the other side is we push out physical products on the market and those are extracted from our mutual resources in, in nature. And there's a kind of discrepancy there. Uh, is that a, a, another way of putting it? What do you think, uh, David? I strongly believe that you need to have 50% hardcore uh, business acumen and 50% raw creativity. Mm. And I've been in the industry starting off as a management consultant and then for 21 years, the complexity of the industry, we should also have that respect. Like imagine being a retailer today, they have maybe 50, 100 brands that they buy from. One is having uh, two drops, one have 12 drops, some have pre, it's become much more complex. And I've been working with people with, with no data, which are so great in what they're doing, if they're working one to one. Right. But if you then have thousands of uh, retailers, stores, uh, th hundreds of producers, it, data, let's use that to make our lives easier. And then use the human intelligence to spy things up. Right. I'm going to give you an opportunity to explain a little bit more about what you do. And Daniel, maybe you can... Um, wh wh what's the elevator pitch for, for what you are offering to the, to the fashion industry today? Well, uh, we support the process of, let's say, starting to create the data. Um, so from idea, which is more artistic and uh, financial plan to, you know, make the business, getting access to the data that comes from the field. What did we sell? Putting that through collaborating with design, uh, development, uh, sourcing to in making the right choices for what's going into that purchase order for the brands, not uh, really the sell side, yeah. so for the brands and what's going to be on the, on the container. So connecting all these, these facts to make sure that you have the chance of getting the best collection there, best, best hit rate possible, avoiding the 30%, hopefully, of waste that you will create with too much buy. Yeah, I think it's important to, to kind of emphasize the the more you the, the bigger sell through you have which is sell through is a, this term in the industry is about you know profitable profitability in a way but sell through also means the products are actually going to the consumer and are not left on the shelf or in a warehouse somewhere which is that's the overproduction uh, am i s stating this correctly do you think 100% yeah 100% and i think that <coughs> people are people are staring at the financial results asking why didn't we make more margin on this collection well Sometimes you sit there with, with a sports designer, a sportswear designer, a women's wear designer, and, a, and a, a lifestyle designer. All of them designing a t-shirt. Mm. That is a leisure t-shirt. And you have the woman coming in to the women's department buying that red t-shirt. The same time the brand have two other products that look totally the same. But since you don't have transparency, since you don't collect that data, since you don't collaborate around that data. Since you don't get the sales figures in when you start to plan for that collection, well, you will end up in creating three pieces that are the same. So essentially, instead of just starting from scratch with a new collection, you, you get some kind of information, some input from um, of, of what has happened before. 
circularity. Right. How does that work? How much data? You, you, you talked about this concept of data depth. Uh, I, I, I love that. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Uh, I spoke to yeah, s somebody here in, in the group uh, about um, the, the silos that we are creating also when working with the data. Today, a lot of this industry is manual, still uh, manual. We have Excel spreadsheets that's done in a computer, but it could be like a, a, sp a paper spreadsheet. But everybody keeps their own type of information. And you know what your, as a merchandiser, you know what data you need. As a salesperson, you know what data you need. And you start to create these kind of islands of, of data. But the gap in between is empty. I don't need that data, therefore I don't fulfill that data. Somebody else needs it, but it's somebody else's job. But that person don't create it either because it's not their job to do it. And then that means that you have gaps in, in your data, which means that your decision will be limping. So you don't have all the facts that you need to make that decision. Got it. Um, David, uh, Impulse is working... You have a similar uh, uh, kind of language around data, I think, which is why I wanted to put you in the same uh, panel. But you're working in, in a, a different part of the, of the value chain. Maybe you can describe what Impulso is doing in terms of sharing data and creating new, new data transparency. Yeah, our focus then is uh, we building for our customers, which are the brands, uh, a data rail between the brands and the retailers that haven't existed up until now. Uh, and by doing that, uh, you are able to track, structure, and share sales and inventory uh, data in real time. Meaning that for having a wholesale business, which is still 60% of total fashion, 1 trillion euros. I was told 21 years ago that wholesale would uh, disappear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what you're able to do there is that you have full control. You become vertical. So you become like an H&M or a Sarah or a Louis Vuitton so who have their D2 channels, even if you're uh, having wholesale accounts. Mm. So, uh, you know, it seems like this should exist. <laughs> Yeah, you see, I have a lot of gray hair in my beard. And uh, if I'm just looking, and when I was the CEO for Tiger of Sweden, we had a turnover of 130 million. 65 million was sent out in our own channels. We knew every single day what was selling, not selling. We could squeeze out all the profit mm. uh, because I'm a business guy, so I like uh, profit. Uh, and, uh, and then we were sending out 65 million uh, euros to 19 countries and 1,000 point of sales. And we know what we shipped out, but then during the season and we're selling fresh fruit, we were running around like headless chickens. So um, now I've been meeting from Singapore to LA. No, it does not exist. And why the hell not? Mm. Because the data wasn't there. The, the, the rail the visibility wasn't there. Wasn't yeah. there of, yeah, yeah. Everyone is screaming for that. So, so um, it's an interesting. Let's talk about Im implementation and. Um, Sometimes when I describe the, the what I perceive as the kind of issues with the fashion industry to someone who doesn't work in the fashion industry, works in other industries, they are sometimes like just appalled by the the kind of amount of waste we are allowed to produce and the inefficiencies in the value chain and so forth. Um, and when I hear uh, companies like yourselves and other has been on the stage and 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 also other other tech suppliers. It strikes me that it doesn't sound like it's rocket science in terms of the technology. It sounds like the technology is pretty straightforward. We don't need, at least not yet, super complex AI systems. So it seems to me that it is the implementation of technology that, that is the kind of crux of things here. And I think we've been onto it in, in previous sessions as well. You as tech providers to the fashion industry, can you feel this as well, or am I exaggerating? Is it, uh, uh, is it an issue explaining to fashion companies what it is you want to sell and how you want to help them? Uh, Daniel? I think there, there, there are um, differences between the companies. I think the companies that have more defined processes across the business, mm. For them, it's much easier to deploy and implement and also de deploy and understand the meaning behind a, a system that will systematize the 
chaotic way of creating creating styles, meaning entering data to feed the downstream parts of, of that process. The, the more, let's say, artistic freedom you have in these organizations, which is still very important because you need to create that relationship with your customer identity of your product that you create. But the more artistic freedom you have and the more you neglect the fact you need data, the less processes you normally tend to have as well. Oh, which yeah. means it's very difficult to... Or shoot from the hip type of yeah. organization. So wh wh why do you implement this? I don't need it. Right. You know? Um, and then you create yourself obstacles for it instead of seeing it that as actually help aid to to be more efficient and be more be even more creative because you don't waste time in doing stuff that, that you haven't that you don't need to do mm. i think it's that process connection really David, what's been your experience? And, uh, I don't think anyone going to work can say that today my goal is to be very mediocre. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, but what a feeling if I look in from my field there is that uh, everyone has, going back a few years, everyone thought that the data they had was the gold mine. And everyone was keeping that, I wouldn't share it, and very mm. linear thinking. But now uh, people are seeing much more that we are, it's not a linear thing, even in wholesale. If I'm Tiger Sweden as a brand selling something, I will sell to that uh, customer and you need to loop back information. And I think the industry is more like, yeah, please help me. Where should I start? Mm. I think uh, both totally tech people or people with a mixed background needs to help hold the people's hands mm. and take the steps. We've talked before in another session that it, the, you know attacking some of these issues is uh, 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 something that fashion brands has to do with many different disciplines within the the, 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 the organization. The whole leadership team, maybe people responsible for distribution, design, so forth. So you can't really implement these things um, uh, with one person. You can't delegate to one person saying, solve this. Uh, how, uh, how does that work? Because that's got to be a kind of a, I don't know if it's a frustration, but at least a challenge for uh, companies like yourselves talking to the fashion brands. Yeah, but for me then it's like, yeah, but it's, everyone wants to get their products to the end consumer. Mm. Uh, and everyone wants to have the right product at the right time to the producer. Mm. And even the most creative people, if you look at it, it starts with sales numbers. Even the most creative designers, they are like, if I can get data on what's selling and not selling in real time, I can spend 100% uh, of my creativity of 40% uh, of the collection. So it's, it's, the, it's the whole value chain. It's, it's about to understand how this data is used here and now, but also for next planning and so forth, because it's not that complicated. We see demand, we produce something, we ship it out in different uh, sales channels to reach an end consumer. Mm. Uh, but it's uh, a way we decide us. That's super, super important. Yeah, and I think that on that value chain, you, you, what you lack is when you don't have access to the data and you don't connect that data, you lack the possibility to make the right decision what will land uh, at that consumer right. to, be, to be attractive. So, um, and as we talked when you, with Norms and the uh, son of a tail, it comes like if you don't have the real-time data, what should you feed into the production process? Mm. And based on that, you, can, you put the demand on how you become more efficient. Mm. And people don't change. Everyone is lazy. I'm s lying at every interview when I uh, apply for jobs. Yeah, I'm open to change. <laughs> Maybe if I do it myself, <laughs> but, if it, but, if it starts to, but if it starts to hurt, which is in this perfect storm right now, I don't earn money, mm. then people change. Uh, Daniel, uh, when you speak to, to, to your clients and you will reach out to new companies, um, what are the things you feel like you have to explain to them the most or educate to them the most? Uh, is it like you need to think more uh, long term or you need to, to think more uh, holistically about doing this or you need to engage the whole uh, company? Uh, traditionally, people come to us because we are in the earlier phase of the of of the whole process. Mm. Um, with, a, for instance, a sustainability question: How do I? How do I? We have trust trace here up uh, on stage earlier as well. How do I get hold of that data so I can put that into my bill of material? Really, and it becomes very technical. But I think again, it's always it's. 
the later in the process you start to organize the data, the less good decisions you make. Right. So really trying to help these, cust these our customers, our prospects to understand, you know, you, you really, really need to look beyond and, and earlier into the process because mistakes, everybody do because you make decisions based on gut and, and so forth. But the earlier you have access to the information, the better the decision you make. Everybody wants faster time to market. Mm. And we all speak about 12 to 18 months of lead time. I've been in this industry for 20 years and it has been 12 to 18 months lead time. Have to learn you. <laughs> you know that the ship takes six weeks to get from Shanghai or whatever port to, to Europe. Mm. You don't cut that lead time. You cut the lead time by making the decision much closer to when that product will be delivered. And I think that therefore the designer or the people managing that bill of material, which you have to report to get your DPP in place and, uh, and all of that, that decision must have happened much, much, much earlier in the process. Based on the real time sales figures, getting those into the new merchandisers, putting a new plan in place, and already there you must have decided for material, production place, and all of that. Don't wait for the sourcing to make that decision six months or 12 months later, else you won't cut that lead time. Let's end by looking in the crystal ball a little bit. Uh, like five to 10 years, where do you hope the industry will be and how, how will it ha ha change? Both of you, uh, David first. Fantastic, uh, it will be different. <laughs> and it will be better. Uh, I think we will have uh, much more of a network and ecosystem. Uh, the silos will go away. Uh, I hope that we will see uh, the end consumer is in focus. Brands being totally uh, agnostic about in which channels they'll sell uh, and the production getting much more closer. I think we will have uh, much more interaction of actually when you get out products in the system it's not only you yourself that you sell it, you will actually cooperate with other retailers, you will have endless aisles to the brand's uh, inventories to make it much more faster. Because as you said, it's like I haven't seen anyone who have the data and then we sit there and say, ah, we, produ we should produce 200 SKUs, but ah, let's do 4 million. Right. You do it because you don't have the data. So network, uh, holistic ecosystem, fluffy as hell. Daniel, five to ten years. Uh, nobody have been speaking about AI. And I think that is also because of what we started this discussion with. We are afraid of data. I think that AI will help a lot of people to create the bill of materials, to create that all that data entry that we don't want to do. But somebody needs to do the, the pre-work. So AI will help a lot in a lot of work that we don't do today because we don't want to do the job and we are then lack having the depth in the data to make the right decision. I think that is one. And then two, I think because of the the world, how what what's happening, it's not because of sustainability, etc. It that will come as a good effect of it is that we will near shore much more and much fewer volumes of products much faster so we can take advantage of uh, these productions that we have in Boros now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? So um, nearshoring and AI and it will help with data and then continue creativity and win. I'm not going to uh, do a follow up on AI because we don't have time. <laughs> Daniel, David Tunmark and Daniel Del Benedetto, thank you so much for sharing your insights today. Thank you. Thank you.